Kamloops is cool. It's uh, there's 100,000 people that live there. It's funny because it's known for the tournament capital of Canada. So there's all sorts of sport events going on. And yeah, I think the coolest thing about it for me growing up there was like, once I found what I like to do, there was nothing else to do but do that because it was small enough. You, there's not a lot of distractions. And so it's a very mellow blue collar town. Yeah, my grandmother bought me a board for Christmas when I was about four or five. And this is at the time too, when video games were coming out and it was, it was kind of the thing to do. And uh, everything I'd been involved with prior was all organized team sports and I hated it. I hated how it was so put together and there was, it kind of felt like drill sergeant, you know? So I felt kind of free on my board. The blessing was my parents, the house they bought, it just came with this concrete patio in the backyard. And so that's where I learned how to ollie and kickflip everything. It was like a 27 foot long concrete pad. It's so small I couldn't skate it now, but when you're really young, it was perfect. And then I'd go to the skate park sometimes after school or when my parents could take me on the weekend sometimes. And then that's when I got introduced to more of the, the local scene. But for the most part, I was definitely that like loner kid skating. First met him and it was just weird. Everybody in town was like, already knew of him. He was. He was the little kid with the flame helmet and he was he was a ripper. He started at such such a young age and he was so comfortable and like hungry when he was a young kid. Like just his determination is is like none other. Like I've seen Matt learn like five tricks in one day and it didn't seem hard for him. I just love skateboarding so much. At such a young age, it captured me on such a crazy level. Like my passion and drive for it was so obsessive that I, by the time I was eight, I had like had this vision in my head of being a pro skateboarder and living in California. And it's funny because a big genesis to that is based on the videos. It was like watching Flip Sorry, watching Girl, Yeah Right, Hot Chocolate, and then um, video radio. Like, I loved video radio as a kid because I was like, so these guys skate for a living, which is the coolest thing ever. They're all friends and they travel around the world doing demos and people are just happy to see them skate. I was like, this is it, I need to do this. You know, like it sold the dream for sure. I I'm really lucky, like my parents are so supportive. Like they didn't care what I liked. They just wanted to support what I enjoyed doing. And as I was getting better, the local guys who were at B&B were like, yeah, you should, you should film your son do tricks. And so my dad would, he would come and film tricks and whatnot and we put, he put together a video. So it was like really, like we already were kind of like working towards something at a young age. But it was funny because it, it never felt forced. Like it was just what I wanted to do. I was like, this, this is a brand, this is a sponsor I want. And I started riding for the shop as one of our sponsored riders, um, just through friends talking about how talented this kid was and he had a really good sponsor me video. I don't think there was a moment I realized he could go pro, but definitely thought that he had a future as a career or a pro just in that he was so passionate, so dedicated. He got a call from Rodney Mullen and he, he was probably about 10 years old. His dad sent in a bunch of sponsor me tapes to all these distributions and in California and then they would just kind of wait to hear back. I remember I was skating my backyard. My mom came out and opened the glass screen door and was like, Matt, you need to come in right now. Like Rodney Mullins on the phone. And I remember being so young, I didn't believe her. I thought she was just like messing with me because like I was sending out like 14 promos at a time and you just wait to get a call or an email and you don't get it. You know what I mean? So I thought she was just fucking with me. And then I answered the phone and it was Rodney. The godfather of skateboarding, like the guy who invented all the tricks basically. He called Matt on his home phone when he was 10 years old. And that, that's unbelievable. You know, like he, who would ever thought, you know, like I, I knew that he was, that Matt had the, had everything in him. Like, but that as a confirmation, you know, like it was like pretty, pretty special. The 
biggest challenge for skaters to overcome when skating would be injuries. It's a super rough sport. Can you stay healthy and can you get back up after you hurt yourself? I mean, I've been skating for 20 years now and I've definitely had my fair share of injuries. And so I think it's just important to even go in when you're dealing with small stuff. You know, like today I'm just going in because I've been kind of been dealing with a calf problem. Um, but it's like nothing serious, but it's enough to go in and get it worked on and then I'll feel better and then I skate better So I usually go in at least once twice a week when I'm home. Yeah, the surgery I had done in 2016 it just didn't really work I stepped back on my board and I was not skating the same like I didn't come back how I thought to at that point I was like I don't even care about career anymore like I just want to feel good and I want to be able to skate again. Whether or not I get paid to do it, you learn to rebuild your body kind of from scratch, but it's even more complicated because you want to get your body back to a point where you can like put it through a lot. Because most people who have these surgeries are just trying to get back to like feeling good, going to work and sitting at their desk job. So leading into Tampa Pro in March, we were seeing all the news headlines, and then we went and skated the event the following weekend, actually, we had to fly to Toronto to go skate in the Canadian Nationals, which is an Olympic points event. Flew home and then probably within a matter of five days, they shut the borders down like everything was done. But I think the thing that frustrated me the most about it, it was I spent like two weeks in limbo. I'm like sitting here not doing anything, not feeling like I'm progressing or adding value or doing anything. I was trying to figure out something I could be excited about working on that would work while this whole COVID thing's going on. And then that's when I, I thought about Real Street. I owe a lot to Rodney. The biggest thing that he taught me was Quality over quantity, always. I just like to like come up with goals or dreams in my head that I truly think are attainable. And then, all right, there's the goal. Now, what what is my process to get there? And for me, even if I didn't get a medal, you know, even though that's what I wanted to do, if I didn't get it, I would have been happy anyways because at the end of the day, you know, me and Steak really put our absolute hardest into it and it was my best shit. And so no matter what happened, I knew I'd be proud releasing it. Cause that's to me is all that matters as a skateboarder is like, all right, did I give it my all? You know, did I leave no stone unturned? And I did my absolute best with that one. So I'm, I'm stoked. I think uh, someone just showed me a news report like some Google news, and it was saying that skateboarding was going to the Olympics. And I just laughed, <laughs> honestly. I, th I thought two th a couple things. I thought, wow, the, the, the misfits really made it. Like, we're, they're really gonna put us in. So that whole concept's funny because when you know the core of skateboarding, you're like, that, that's absurd. You know, if they knew, they probably wouldn't bring it in. But then the idea for me and why I was like, I, I've always enjoyed skating competitions. I've always fed off of it. And the idea of it being bigger than me was something I thought was cool. The, you know, the idea of representing where you're from and, you know, potentially bringing pride. Like, that's, that's something special. It's pretty, it's kind of surreal. Like, yeah, I just feel like it's like watching your sibling, your brother, achieve something great you know like you know, I know I achieve stuff like that's great on like a daily basis and stuff but to see how recognized he is now is yeah I'm happy for him man. I'm super happy being able to hopefully have some level of like building support around our community because it's changed my life and given me so much in a way where it's so hard to not think about it myself when I was 14 years old not able to skate six months of the year because no one cared about it. It was just this small little community and it's grown so big now. And now it's at a level where, you know, mom and pop recognize it as something legitimate when they hear skateboarders are on Team Canada. They don't look at it as the same. And some people might not like that. Skaters might, will be like, well, it needs to be like this, but that's just your perception of what you think skateboarding should be. But when I look at it as a more grand picture, 
I think that's where the real opportunity lies. And this is for like all of skateboarding, any, any country. If they go and prove that skateboarders matter in their country, they just brought national eyes, like world eyes to their, their skateboarding in their country. There's going to be support that comes along with it to build that community, right? Especially growing up skating where I, I grew up skating, I watched skateboarding save a lot of people from going down the wrong route. Seeing the impact, how it's changed my life, like that, that would be the coolest thing about it, 100%.